probably a good thing my wife is probably leaving the room at the moment because I'll probably embarrass her with this very first line right here. There's a famous song, it's now probably a couple generations ago, that says, sometimes it's hard to be a... What's the line? Do I have to sing it for you? Yes. Sometimes it's hard to be a... Thank you. Somebody finally knew it. I can't believe nobody knew that song. You were afraid to admit it? You did. How could you not know that song? Oh, I, now see, I feel bad. I feel bad. Sometimes it's hard to be a woman, right? And it's even harder when you live in a time when people can't even tell what a woman is anymore. If you haven't seen the, that documentary that actually came out and they did that for free yesterday, I don't know if it's still even available, I would recommend it. But this kind of difficulty is not necessarily a new thing. You know, for you ladies, it's been around for a long time. And you, know, you may have a hard time or you may be standing by your man as the song kind of goes. But what if he doesn't believe that? What if he doesn't believe in you? What, what is it like to bear an accusation even that is untrue? That's some of the things that's going on in this Torah portion is that idea of accusations. It's in Numbers chapter 5. And, you know, this, this has this section dealing with it, with uh, accusations made against a wife that may be true, that may not be true, and that's, of course, the uncertainty. It's been a difficult passage for, for many to come to terms with over the years, and it starts with a, a suspicious man who has no real proof of, of any kind of wrongdoing or indiscretion on her part. In Numbers chapter 5, verse 14, it says, uh, A spirit of jealousy overcomes him, and he is suspicious of his wife when she is impure. Or, a spirit of jealousy overcomes him, and he suspects his wife, yet she is not impure. This will be a very dangerous situation. Uh, in most cultures, a woman accused like this had very little recourse. She had very little protection. You know, verse 13 talks about it giving information that what, what was lacking about not having any kind of, of witnesses. She was not caught in the act. So, but in many cultures, that didn't matter. Being caught in the act didn't matter. Not having, witness, having witnesses or not having witnesses wasn't even necessary. All that mattered many times was the accusation. And so as a result, her marriage, her reputation could be ruined. She could be cast out. Sometimes her life could be taken with very little effort. But God's people were supposed to be different. But in, in many of these cultures, everyone, and even when just an accusation gets made, Everybody forms an opinion, don't they? Don't everybody like to have an opinion about the gossip and all the things that's going on in the world? Everybody forms an opinion. Rumor starts to fly, and it's all based on an accusation of infidelity. And imagine that the accusation is said about you, but you are the faithful wife. Imagine how hard that would be, being accused, having false things said about you, things that could not be proven or even really unproven. And it's said by your own husband, the one who is supposed to be your protector, the one who's supposed to be your provider. What's your recourse? What can you do to defend yourself? What if everybody believes him? You know, if they were to go out to a, a secular court they were governed by a different Torah, a different law, she could lose everything, right? Imagine being innocent of the charges before a secular or even a corrupted court. When the outcomes uh, is determined more by bribery or politics more than truth and justice, when outcomes and judgments are often known long before any witness is even called, 
I mean, it's not like we have any troubles with that these days, right? That's not happening anywhere in this country, is it? See, the further a country and its laws get from the Torah of God, there is a greater injustice and abuse that is possible. That means more of the innocent get condemned and more of the guilty get let off. And again, I think that's one of the things that we're seeing in our nation today, isn't it? Because much of the Torah is giving instructions about how to make right judgments. It's about establishing a justice system to where those kinds of things don't happen. God's Torah builds in some protections for people, especially for those that are vulnerable, especially for the vulnerable wife. And rather than a secular court, they were supposed to go before the courtroom of the Lord. You know, in chapter 5, verse 15, it says, if he suspects these things, if he is jealous uh, for whatever reason, he, he should take his wife to the Kohen, to the priest. He must also bring a tenth of an ephah, so he's bringing an offering. A barley flour as an offering for her. He is not to pour oil or put incense on it because it is an offering for jealousy, a reminder offering, drawing attention to guiltiness. And the Kohen is to bring her near and have her stand before Adonai. Now why would you go before Adonai? Remember back in, in verse 13, it says that there was no witness against her. She was not caught in the act. Why go before Adonai? And here you are in a day when there were no photographs, there was no security footage, there was no hidden cameras. Isn't it a good idea to go to the God who sees? Go before El Roy. And that comes out of Genesis chapter 16 with Hagar. He is the God who sees everything. Nothing is hidden from him. Nothing escapes his notice. You know, as Psalm 139 talks about, he says, Adonai, you searched me and you know me. Whenever I sit down or stand up, you know it. You discern my thinking from afar. You observe my journeying and my resting, and you are familiar with all my ways. Where can I go from your ruach? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, look, you are there too. If I take the wings of the dawn and settle on the other side of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand will lay hold of me. If I say, surely darkness covers me. Night keeps light at a distance from me, but even darkness is not dark for you and night is as bright as day. Darkness and light are alike. See, there's no place that you can go that he is not able to see exactly what is going on in your life. And that truth is comforting for the innocent wife. The fact that he is the God who sees and knows exactly what her situation is. Now, on the flip side of that, that truth should not be very comforting for those who are doing wrong. For those who are trying to get away with things, because God sees that too. Your only way out realizing that God sees everything is through repentance, through teshuva, the work of Messiah. And see here in this situation, despite all of the jealousies and accusations of someone who was not there, someone who didn't see anything, who doesn't know anything, you are putting, going before the Lord, you are putting your trust in the one who was there. And the one who saw everything, who knows exactly what is true. And it takes more than just you know, his feeling of jealousy, more than just his suspicions and his fears and insecurities to convict her. And God provides a way to discover the truth. It says, then the Kohen is to take some holy water in a clay jar and take some dust from the floor of the tabernacle and put it into the water. 
Then the Kohen will have the woman stand before Adonai, loosen the woman's hair, put, her, put into her hands the reminder offering, the offering for jealousy, while in the Kohen's own hands are the bitter waters that bring a curse. It says, Then the Kohen will have her swear under oath, and then say to the woman, If no man other than your husband has slept with you, and if you have not gone astray into impurity from your husband, may this bitter water that brings a curse not harm you. For the wife who has been falsely accused, this is a great protection. Protection from an irrational jealousy, from anger, from malice, from agendas, from lies or other whispering rumors. It's a comfort because God knows the truth. His opinion is the only one that matters. He will see that justice is done. And if she is innocent, the bitter water will not harm her. And, you know, that's how it says in verse 28. If, however, the woman has not defiled herself and is clean, she will be free from guilt and be able to have children. You know, there's no indication anyway that the effects were instantaneous. You know, it talks about her, her, her stomach, her belly, you know, swelling up, her thigh, you know, deteriorating. There's no indication that that was an instantaneous thing. But if she is innocent, she will remain healthy. She will be able to bear children. And you might not see the fruit of that for some time. But this proves that he is able to vindicate the innocent. It proves also that he is able to convict the guilty even if nobody was there to witness it. Even if there are no, is no proof. And that is quite the contrast to the way our systems work. You know, the court of a pu public opinion may assume guilt, right? Doesn't it often typically assume guilt? You hear one thing bad about somebody and you typically believe the worst. That's how all the newspapers do it. That's how all the, the rumor magazines take it. They're assuming the worst. Even a secular court may unjustly rule against you. But the reality is, is only his opinion matters because he knows what is true and what is not. And he has a way of bringing this out. When we stand before the king, he is able to determine guilt or innocence in a perfect justice. It may not be recognized here, but when we stand before him, it is perfect justice. That is what his throne is built upon. Psalm 89 says, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Loving kindness and truth go before you. And when we think about the days that are ahead, when we think about the days that are coming, this reality should be a great comfort to his people. What did Yeshua say about the days that are coming? Did he not warn us that we should expect hardships coming from the world? Did he not promise that in this world you're going to have what? You're going to have trouble. Did he not promise that as lawlessness, as toralessness, as, a, as more and more of a life and a culture gets pulled away from his ways, that the love of many is going to do what? It's going to grow cold. It's going to decrease. They're going to become harsher and harsher. He promised days ahead that were like the days of Noah which were increasingly violent and hostile toward anybody who was holding on to a relationship to a faith in God. We should expect persecution, he says. We should expect even false accusation. We should expect being taken to court and standing before judges on account of our faith and be in a situation much like the innocent woman was the innocent wife. Yeshua even confirmed this in his Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 5, he says, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for doing the right thing, for living in the right way by his way. 
for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely on account of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets. In other words, if this is happening to you, you're in good company. See, the world wants to do all that and, and accuse you of all those things, say all kinds of horrible and terrible things in order to shame you so that you'll do what? So that you will stop living for righteousness. So that you will keep your mouth shut. When it's time to speak. And see, as the world and its system decays, you know, that should we should expect this to be happening more and more. Peter even warned about the people who have bought into a life of Torahlessness. You know, when he's talking about carrying out the desires of the pagans in first Peter chapter four. And he goes through a long list of things that they like to do, and it's like reading the newspaper. But he says, they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same riot of recklessness. And they will vilify you. Because you don't go along with it, because you don't participate in it, they're going to start saying all kinds of bad things about you. Because you're doing what is Right. It's, the statement is very similar to a pattern that we've seen play out in our lifetime and in, in our culture in regard to immorality. It's a cycle that has it's you know, it's local, it's state, it's national, it's it's in churches, it's in political parties. It's it's everywhere. It's that cycle of immorality. You'll probably see variations of this. In fact, I saw one this morning right after I uh, put this up here. But, you know, it starts out with tolerating the immorality, tolerating the wrong, putting up with it. Okay, we're, it's there. Okay, you're free to do what you want to do. We're just going to not say anything about it. And that moves then to acceptance, where it becomes the new normal. And everybody else says, okay, this, is, this has now been approved. Then it goes to the idea of promotion. Have y'all seen this before? Then, then you're supposed to start promoting it. Then you're supposed to be encouraging it. Then you're supposed to start celebrating it. And it really moves from there to not just promotion. Now you've got to participate in it. And if you don't, you're now the one that's in the wrong. You're, you're supposed to participate in it, but if you don't participate in it, then surely we're going to make sure that your, your children and future generations do. Because now it's normal. Now it's a part of the culture. Now it's a part of regular life. And you're going to be giving your children to whatever it is. The, the, what I found right after I wrote this was another variation of it. First we overlook evil, then we permit evil, then we legalize evil. Then we promote evil, evil, then we celebrate evil, then we persecute those who still call it evil. That's the cycle. Where do you think we are in this cycle? We're not up here at the top, are we? We're getting down here to this part. They are surprised that you do not run with them into the same riot of recklessness, the same flood of dispensation, I think is what one of the other translations will say. And so they vilify you. You become wrong by not standing against it. You become the bad guy. You become the immoral person for not going along, not promoting, not participating. But the great thing about it is in, in this same passage, Peter also provides some hope. And it's the same kind of hope that the woman had, the innocent wife has in verse 5. But they will have to give an account to the one who stands ready to judge the living and the dead. Are they going to have to stand before Adonai? Yes, they are. 
And is it the same God who sees her innocence is the same one who sees their guilt? Yes. The comfort is that whether or not public opinion ever changes for your benefit, that you are ever vindicated, that the false accusations are ever proven untrue, ever found not guilty by the standards of the world, whether any of that ever happens, those who vilify you will have to stand before God and answer for what they have done. You know, he, Peter goes on to repeat Yeshua's warning from the Sermon on the Mount just a few verses later in verse 14 of chapter 40, of chapter 4. He says, if you are insulted for the name of Messiah, you are fortunate for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. You know, the world is going to be trying to increasingly insult you, accuse you, persecute you, all because you hold to a faith in Messiah. And while they are doing that here in this world, while this world is doing all of that to those who believe in him, what does he say? What's happening in God's world? He's blessing. He is blessing you in his world. The spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But he also wanted to make sure that they understood. Peter wanted them to know that all of those accusations, all of those wrongdoings, none of this matters if those accusations of wrongdoing are true. Because he goes on here in verse 15. For let none of you suffer as a murderer or thief or evildoer or as a troublemaker. Right? If those accusations that they make are actually genuine, you're not going to receive the blessing from that. But he says, if anyone suffers for following Messiah, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this name. Innocent suffering carries no shame. But the world is going to try to make you ashamed. The world is going to try to make you not want to acknowledge him. You know, all your problems, all these issues are going to just go away if you just drop it. That's the kind of shame that the world wants to get. You know, Paul experienced some of these things in himself on his journeys around the Mediterranean. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, you know, says, For it seems to me that God has put us, the, the emissaries, the apostles, on display last of all, like men sentenced to death. For we have become a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to people. We are fools for Messiah's sake, but you are wise in Messiah. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honored but we are dishonored. What's going on here is many of these Corinthians were being left alone while Paul and his party were getting in trouble. And they were trying to suggest that, well, Paul, you know, if you were a better person, you wouldn't get in so much trouble. Is that true? Is that how it works? He says, to this very hour, we are both hungry and thirsty, dressed in rags and mistreated and homeless. We toil, working with our own hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure. When we are slandered, we speak kindly. We have become the scum of the earth and the dregs of all things, even to this moment. He is willing to go through and endure all of that and not let go of who? Not let go of Yeshua. Not let go of Messiah. He says, I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to warn you as my dearly loved children. Why does he have to give them a warning? Because it's coming for you. It's coming for you too. If you take this faith seriously, 
if you hold on to Messiah, you are not going to ever be exempt. You may be okay at the moment, but it is coming for you. Most of us have not gone through anything like that in our walk of faith. Agreed? Historically speaking, we've got to understand that not experiencing these things, that's the exception rather than the rule. We have been extraordinarily protected here in this nation for the last couple of hundred years. Here, we, we have not had to go through that. It's going around, it's going on in other places. But the more that we strive to live for God, the more that we stand out, uh, and the more likely that we're not going to be going down that broad road that leads to the wide gate of destruction, the more that we live f by Him and His ways, the more attention gets drawn to us. And they will come against us for, for wanting to stay on the narrow path that leads to the narrow gate that leads to life. You know, in coming against us, we're going to be forced to deal with loss. Loss of friends and family, loss of jobs, loss of being accepted in polite and cultured society. You're going to have to deal with all kinds of accusations that are coming our way, false accusations and standing before some kind of civil authority. And if it hasn't happened to you, I'm thankful for that. But understand that it will likely happen in the days and the years ahead because it is already happening. It is already happening in various places, happening in, in Canada, in England, Australia, where you know, praying on the sidewalk can get you arrested, where reading from the Bible can get you arrested. You know, these centers of Western civilization are starting to turn against those who are, who are holding to Messiah. You know, it's happened already to pro-life advocates here in America. It happened just the other day to a baseball player who shared a post on Facebook. Who the, he then had to feel the pressure and back down, unfortunately. You must be prepared for that possibility. And you've also got to, be, to know that we cannot compromise our faith. We cannot back down from what the life that God has called us to. We must be prepared to be falsely accused, to have your reputation tarnished, and even hear some of your fellow believers who were not there, who were not witnesses, who have no evidence of those things, who they might believe the things that are said about you. But you need not be ashamed if those accusations are false. You must be prepared to defend on the Father, depend on the Father in such moments for vindication because public opinion, public acceptance does not matter. He is the only one who knows. He is the only one who sees. Because we've seen in this country that even if you do compromise, even if you do give a little, if you're not all in, if you're not fully accepting, if you're not fully embracing, promoting, celebrating, and participating, if you don't join with them in that same riot of recklessness with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, will you be accepted? Will the accusation stop? Or will the pressure continue until you, fu you fully cave? That's the, that's the pattern. If you still claim Yeshua at all, you will not be accepted by the world. We cannot seek or win the world's approval. We must live for God's and seek His approval. Remember this verse, verse 15. Let none of you suffer as a murderer or thief, evildoer, or as a troublemaker. These are the kinds of things that cannot define who we are. Are they going to say these kind of things about you? Yep, they sure are. And if these things are true, then we cannot expect God's blessing. We cannot claim persecution if we're actually doing wrong. 
Peter says just a couple of chapters earlier, he says, Loved ones, I urge you as strangers and sojourners to keep away from the fleshly cravings that war against the soul. He says, keep your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, among the pagans. Then while they speak against you as evildoers, they may, there's always the possibility that some of them, somewhere, they may, from noticing your good deeds, glorify God in the day of visitation. There may be some, even in the midst of the accusation, that come to know him through that. Because God sees all of this. Our conduct matters to him and to the world. And while most may condemn, some may want to know more. Some may come to faith. What they want, might want to know what makes you different. Why are you not willing to go along with everything else? And they may be, end up being beside you, glorifying God in worship on the day of his return. But here's the hard part about all of this. The hard part about the God who sees, he really does see. And there's nothing that is hidden from your sight, from his sight. You know, I asked you earlier to imagine yourself as the innocent, falsely accused wife and how this was seen as protection. But the reality is, in a spiritual sense, since all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, we're not the innocent wife, are we? In reality, in the spiritual realm of things. You know, Isaiah chapter 2 reminds us that our sins are as scarlet. He's like, look, you want to you argue, want to debate about it? Come, let us reason together. Your sins are like scarlet. That's a, an absolute statement. We, we don't get to debate that. And the other aspect of that is we have a jealous husband. Exodus chapter 20, in the midst of the Ten Commandments, he says, you shall have no other gods before me. Verse 4 says, do not make for yourself a graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or on the earth below or in the water under the earth. Do not bow down to them. Do not let anyone make you serve them. For I, Adonai, your God, am a jealous God. Exodus 34, 14 says, because you are not to bow down to any other God, since Adonai, whose very name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Deuteronomy confirms that again. For Adonai, your God, is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Our husband is jealous, jealous for us. And he seeks to protect us. And the difference between our jealous God, does he have witnesses against us? Plenty. You know, heaven and earth serve and testify against us. And when we think of the process, you know, here we are, we, he sees everything. When we think of this process that's here in Numbers chapter 5, of being brought before the Lord, going to the priest and being brought before the Lord, as much comfort as that should bring when we are innocent, how do we feel when we know that we are guilty? Is that very comforting to know that you're going to be brought before the Lord who sees everything when you know that you are guilty? That's not very comforting. I would not want to be in that situation. You know, over, uh, do, um, this should be numbers, sorry. It says, if however you have gone astray from your husband, if you, not, um, you, if you became impure and had sexual relations with a man other than your husband, then the Kohen is to have the woman swear under this oath of a curse and say to the woman, then let Adonai cause you to be cursed and denounced among your people when Adonai causes your thigh to rot and your belly to swell. He says, may this water, 
which brings a curse into your body and cause your belly to swell and your thigh to rot. And the woman is to say, Amen, Amen. Then the Kohen is to write these curses on a scroll and wash them into the waters of bitterness. The Kohen will then have the woman drink the bitter water, bearing curses, so that the water of the curses of bitterness enters her. Again, if you are innocent, you're going to be vindicated. If you are guilty, do you ever want to get to this point? Mm -mm. No guilty woman who believes in God at all is going to really let it get to that point of saying amen and amen and then drink that water. For the innocent person, this process brings vindication. For the guilty, <clears throat> this process had better lead to something else. And God's intention in that is that if you're smart, which we're not always that smart, but it should lead to confession and repentance and teshuva. You know, you should never let it get to this point when you know that you are guilty. And we have a jealous husband and we have sinned. We have committed spiritual adultery. We are essentially Gomer. We are the, the, the adulterous wife to a faithful husband. So the only course of action for us is, again, it's confession and teshuva because we cannot pay the price for our sin. And thankfully, that's the Messiah. Our bridegroom is willing to pay the price, just like Hosea, and buy back what is rightfully his already. You know, Hosea chapter 3 says, Then Adonai said to me, Go again, love a woman who is loved by a companion and committing adultery, just as Adonai has loved Bnei Israel, the children of Israel, while they were turning to other gods and loving the, the raisin cakes, it says, so I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver and an omer and a half of barley. He paid, bought her out of the market because she was serving as a prostitute. That's how much the father loves us. That's the, the willingness that he is willing to pay a price that he did not owe. He had rightful claim to her already. And he pays it. He is willing to pay in the market for his own bride, uh, to pay a price for her freedom when she is the one who broke the covenant, not him. And it's Hosea whose actions mirror the Messiah, takes her home and cleans her up. He removes the filth of her prostitution, just like the filth of our spiritual idolatry is removed from us. That's how Hosea talks about it in chapter 2. He says, In that day it is a declaration of Adonai, you will proclaim my husband and never again call me my Baal. Then I will remove the names of the Baalim, the other gods, out of her mouth, no longer to be mentioned by their name. It says, In that day I will make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, the flying creatures in the sky, or the creeping things on the ground. I will break into pieces the bow and the sword and warfare from the land, and I will cause them to lie down securely. It says, Then I will betroth you to me forever. We're going to renew this covenant. We're going to renew this marriage, this relationship. Yes, I will betroth you to me with righteousness, with justice, with covenant loyalty and compassion. And I will betroth you to me with faithfulness. And you will know Adonai. Does he know she's guilty? Yes. Is he going to take her back? Is he going to clean her up and do all the things necessary to make her a pure and spotless bride? Yes, our sins are covered by the blood of the Lamb. And it's only after we come in repentance and teshuva that we are cleansed. That's how John, 1 John talks about it. He 
says, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess, that's where he's always trying to take us who are guilty. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That's what a faithful husband does for his bride. Faithfulness and honor is the goal of that kind of godly jealousy. You know, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul builds on that idea. He says, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I betrothed you to one husband to present you to Messiah as a pure virgin. And when the world does everything it can to make that not happen, the world you know, wants to change the definition of sin, change the definition of righteousness, change marriage or anything else. When the world wants to accuse you of doing wrong, when in God's eyes you are doing right, then who do we trust in? We trust in the God who sees, the God before whom we're all going to have to stand. You know, there's a passage out of Isaiah that even puts it like this. It says, for Adonai Elohim will help me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I set my face like flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. The one who vindicates me is near. Who will accuse me? Let us stand up to each other. Who is my adversary? Let him confront me. For see, Adonai Elohim will help me. Who is he who would condemn me? See, they all wear out like a garment. A moth will eat them up. Who among you fears Adonai, who hears the voice of his servant, who walks in darkness and has no light? Let him trust in the name of Adonai and lean on his God. That's what we need in the days ahead, because we know where this is going. He's already told us the direction of things. There's going to be accusations made against God's people. Sometimes they're going to be true. But can that person be redeemed and restored and forgiven? Absolutely. But the way this world is going, many times those accusations, the things that we hear, the things that are going to make the news, they're not going to be true. And we need to trust in the one who vindicates, the one who sees, the one who restores. Because it's his court, it's his opinion, that matters.